Um, today, we're going to share the story of the development of the San Francisco Department of Public Health Managed Alcohol Program, which started as a COVID response initiative and has transitioned to a continuity program serving individuals with severe alcohol use disorder who are not currently interested in abstinence based programming or support. I'm delighted to be co presenting with Megan Kennel, um, the charge nurse um, for our programs. Um, during today's talk, um, we aim to introduce the philosophy behind managed alcohol programs, describing how these programs fit into the spectrum of alcohol harm reduction work. We then plan to tell the story of the San Francisco managed alcohol program, reviewing its history and providing a glimpse into the on the ground experience of participants and staff. Finally, we would like to highlight how we approach the complex medical ethical questions that have come up for our team during the iterative development of our care model. Prior to COVID-19 and the initiation of the San Francisco Managed Alcohol Program as a COVID response initiative, I knew frightfully little about the concept of managed alcohol, despite working with the San Francisco Department of Public Health Alcohol Sobering Center. This is in part because managed alcohol programs, especially formal clinician-driven models, are not common in the United States. This approach has been used widely in Canada and a number of European countries for some time. Managed alcohol programs exist as part of the continuum of alcohol use related harm reduction strategies, both abstinence based um, programs, as well as non abstinence based programs, ranging from programs like residential treatment and sober living environments to non abstinence based programs like moderation management um, skills and alcohol sobering centers. I briefly want to mention that there are two main types of managed alcohol programs. Peer-led managed alcohol programs, which are often run by individuals with lived experience and clinician-initiated models, which may be better suited to serve individuals who are at high risk of withdrawal complications or have medical complications associated with their alcohol use disorder. Our program falls into the latter category, with the majority of our participants having high levels of clinical, functional, and cognitive support needs that are often as a result of their longstanding alcohol use disorder. If you have an interest in learning more about the full spectrum of MAP programs um, available um, and being implemented, I highly encourage you to visit the Canadian Managed Alcohol website. It's called CMAPS. Um, there's a URL included in our reference. They have an extensive collection of resources and our program has relied heavily on um, their resources during our development, our programmatic development process. Unlike many of the other alcohol harm reduction strategies, the primary goal of managed alcohol is not to decrease the volume of alcohol being consumed. Rather, the goal is to mitigate many of the health, legal, and interpersonal harms associated with unsafe alcohol use. This includes dangerous alcohol withdrawal symptoms, physical injuries and accidents, as well as EMS, ED, and criminal justice encounters. Managed alcohol programs also focus on improving participants' sense of safety, security, and overall quality of life. There are multiple existing treatment models for people who are interested in abstinence. In managed alcohol, we come from the approach that our clients shouldn't have to be abstinent to connect to care, feel safe, or have dignity. This philosophical shift is fundamental to providing care in the MAP model. However, I do not want to minimize how unsettling and uncomfortable this shift can be, even for the most seasoned harm reduction focused program staff. Our team's weekly case conference routinely revisits this philosophical framework, questioning the trade-off between structuring our program as participant-driven versus our desire sometime, to sometimes more aggressively encourage less alcohol use in line with the wishes we may have for our clients. We often discuss the importance of making a distinction between what we ideally would wish for clients and, what, um, and respecting the wishes that they've expressed for themselves. This list includes the core components of our managed alcohol program. 
What makes this model distinct is that regulated amounts of alcohol are dispensed by program staff. In, and in our model that um, program staff are registered nurses. Megan will go over the details of dosing the dosing schedule shortly. Um, each participant's schedule is personalized to their individual needs and desires. Our program is currently housed in a motel style facility and participants receive room and board. One of the great successes of our managed alcohol program is our ability to offer a sheltering setting that works for the large percentage of our participants who are street homeless and otherwise failing in the shelter and housing models available within the San Francisco system. Our map is currently a closed model, which means participants only go off site with program staff. We're actively working on protocols to facilitate community independence um, as a um, way to a graduated um, experience once people stabilize. We offer linkages to medical and behavioral health services, though engagement um, in those services is not a prerequisite or a requirement to remain in the program. Our team also offers other harm reduction and skill building services that Megan will describe. Here are some common MAP eligibility criteria present in the literature. Many programs focus on persons experiencing homelessness. In some locations, non-beverage forms of alcohol consumption, such as consuming hand sanitizer or antifreeze, is one of the one form of high-risk drinking that MAP is designed to try to curtail and to support people around. For our program in specific, the target population includes individuals with severe alcohol use disorder who are experiencing harms due to their alcohol use, but are not motivated for abstinence or who have not had success in abstinence-based programs. Subpopulations of focus for our program include individuals experiencing homelessness or at risk of homelessness, though having housing does not disqualify someone um, as a to of being a potential um, candidate for enrollment. We also focus on individuals who have a high acute medical service utilization, such as ED visits and EMS activations. And we um, have a sub focus on individuals who are members of the Latinx and indigenous Mayan population, as those populations um, have high rates of alcohol use disorder and um, are underserved in our city. I'm gonna take a break now, pass along the presentation to Megan, who's gonna share um, uh, our, the story of our program, how it came to be, um, and uh, what a day in the life looks like for some of our clients. Good afternoon, everyone. I just want to echo Devora, um, and we're very grateful that you have us here today. We love talking about this work that we're doing um, and just hope that it can expand into other cities um, across the state. So a little bit about the background of how we got to be doing managed alcohol. So the photo here is a picture of our congregate um, sobering center. Um, and this was pre-COVID. Um, you can see how close the beds were together. We had a 12-bed sobering center that we've been operating since 2003. We see about 5,000 visits per year, and we're also part of the state alternate destination pilot, which means that ambulances can pick some up in the community. Um, they're cleared per their guidelines, and then they can bring them directly to us at the sobering center um, rather than taking them to, the, to an ER. So our sobering center was set up as a diversion from the emergency department for folks that are acutely intoxicated on alcohol. So constantly folks in and out um, through that area. So fast forward then to early COVID um, days, which is kind of a blur, um, but May 2020, um, we had two positive clients that were bouncing kind of all around the system, but while they were with us, they exposed 23 um, PUIs during about a 36 hour period um, when they were in the sobering center. So we quickly had to shift gears. Uh, luckily, um, San Francisco already had developed an INQ system. So they were renting out hotels within the city. Um, folks that were either exposed to COVID or positive for COVID could go stay there. They had already developed um, a low level alcohol management program there and clients could drink up to eight a day and would have to self manage. Unfortunately, our clients were, which are very high utilizers of the system, um, severe alcohol use disorder did not fall into that criteria of drinking less than eight. Um, Luckily, basically over a two day period, um, Devorah in conjunction with our nurse practitioner put together protocols and we basically moved, we closed our congregate sobering center. We moved um, 
everything to this INQ hotel, including our staffing, and at that time started a managed alcohol program with our clients that had been exposed to COVID. Next slide. So uh, the center picture there is our little makeshift first a nurse's station we had at the INQ building. Um, so during our first two weeks, we considered it our INQ pilot of the 23 clients that we had to found that had been exposed by our two positive COVID clients. Um, we were able to track down 11. That was in conjunction with our partners in the community, um, part of a community paramedicine team. So they brought those 11 in within the first two days and we got them going on our new protocols. And what we found during that two week period that we didn't anticipate was this really glaringly obvious newfound stability. Um, it wasn't always easy, but we had clients that we had never really seen out of an in intoxicated state, um, you know, being able to manage um, many things that we had, we I'll get to it a little later, but things that we just really didn't envision. So we, our minds were blown. And in addition to kind of the quality of life piece that we saw, um, it was found during those first two weeks that likely in be, by being in MAP, the, um, we had averted um, 23 EMS activations just by having those clients on site with us. So because of all of the really positive outcomes just from those two weeks, we were allowed to continue our, our MAP program as an established COVID response program. So we stayed at that first INQ location for a little bit of time, and then we were moved to a new location, co-located with medical respite. We were able to reopen our congregate, or not congregate, our sobering center and have folks um, into individualized room. And at that point, we had a 10 bad, 10 bad 10 bed map program kind of focused around um, how to manage COVID times. Out of that, we have fortunately been able to continue our MAP program, and we're now an established program as part of a post-pandemic longitudinal program. We're in a little bit of a growing phase right now. We have a 12-bed MAP program. We're expanding to 20. Um, 10 of the new beds are going to be earmarked to serve the Latinx population, and as we grow, we are keeping um, that 50% um, census um, as we're continuing on. And right now, we're we're really trying to get out of this um, COVID response, emergency response, and look at what is it going to look like to have um, a permanent MAP program, um, always growing, always changing, and really kind of relying on, um, Devor mentioned, we get a lot of our, our, our protocols from the Canadian programs and really try to model off of already existing programs. Next slide. So um, a little bit about our staffing model, which has changed initially when we started, we were really just using, we had primarily um, registered nurse staffing at our sobering center. So that's what we brought over with us to our MAP program. And initially our nurses were doing everything from dosing, from assessments to behavior, behavioral health interventions, um, passing out meals even. And so we've really shifted away from that and growing into a very multi multidisciplinary program. Um, we're getting there. Our goal staffing for MAP is going to look like um, labeled here. We are going to have two nurses per shift for day and swing. We're going to continue to have a de dedicated MAP social worker and a really big piece that we're looking forward to having is 24-7 behavioral health techs. Uh, right now, our nursing staff and our health workers and our social workers are doing a lot of the behavioral health interventions, the milieu management, um, and we're hoping to get away from the nursing staff being the main folks that are providing all of the care and really having it kind of um, parceled out to different members of the team. We're going to continue to partner with our community paramedic teams to help us with community engagement outside of MAP, and then we'll be increasing our nurse practitioner support. Right now it's 0.2 to a 0.5 model, which means um, every day of the week we will then have um, provider support on site. Another big piece is um, we currently have shared leadership team with medical respite and as MAP expands, we'll be having our own nurse manager. We'll have an addiction med doctor that is focused with us and then an operations manager, which we currently don't have. Again, a lot of the day to day stuff does fall on the nursing staff right now as we've been growing and building um, into a bigger program. Next slide. 
So this is my favorite part to talk about because it's when clients are first coming into us and really shifting from how they're navigating in the community to then being with us in managed alcohol. So just like with a BUP start, we we call our first 48 hours the induction period, the time when they're coming in, they're being really um, monitored, very, very, very medicalized. And um, I will say it's a very time intensive period. So um, in conjunctions with our provider, either the nurse practitioner or the um, MD, there's gonna be a clinical review of the comorbidities that could complicate the person's induction period when they're with us. We also utilize the client's self-report of their total daily SDE use. And you'll hear us throw around the term SDE quite often. It stands for standard drink equivalent, and it is how we, um, talk about doses of alcohol. So the two types of alcohol we have in our program are vodka and beer. So one shot of vodka is equal to one SDE and one 12 ounce beer is also equivalent to one SDE. And clients can um, ask for those interchangeably. So we have two protocol pathways that determines um, how their induction is going to go. So we have a less than 10 SDE protocol if that's where the client reports and then a greater than 10 Best baseline SDE protocol. So basically the only difference is how much they can get during every um, check, which is happening every two hours. Um, so the nurse, every two hours for that first 48 hour period, the nurse is assessing their raise score, which is a, it's a pretty subjective rapid intoxication scale, and then also um, assessing their CWA. So before each SD is administered, we're, we're assessing them both for withdrawal and both for over intoxication. Um, Clients can also, in between those two hours, ask for an additional SD, and they can get it as long as they're not over intoxicated. Um, the one thing I'll share is we've it's been two and a half years, and we've had a, a lot of growth that's happened. And initially, because we were so used to seeing clients in withdrawal and thinking about CWAS and thinking about withdrawal, initially looking back, we were um, at times underdosing folks because it was almost like we were waiting for their CWAS to start rising. Um, we've now learned we do not we don't we don't want our clients in induction to have any kind of a CWA at all. In fact, it's okay if they're even edging towards a little bit intoxicated as long as their raise score is greater than three. So that was initially um, a bit of a growing pain for us was shifting that thinking to providing doses only when someone is in withdrawal. We actually want to keep them at very comfortable and not have no CWA posted at all. Um, during that induction period, that is a hard. It's a fine line because folks are coming off of community drinking where they're drinking in excess often a half pint or a pint at a time and now they're kind of having to take just one to two SDEs at a time. Um, it's a very difficult period both time intensive for staff and then also difficult for the clients. We have um, lost to care several clients during the induction period because it is so difficult for them them to navigate that time period. Next slide. So then after the first 48 hours, sometimes we extend it if we need a little bit more data, if someone's drinking um, is not pretty consistent over that time. And we'll we'll look at it um, every four, 24 hours and see how much um, alcohol the client has been consuming during that time. Well, then the, the little chart listed here is one of our first pretty antiquated um, list of how we um, post up our SDE schedules in the nurse's station. So once we determine their daily drinking, we're typically separating it out into either Q4 hours or Q6 hours. So they're receiving doses um, three to four times per day. Um, we have gone up, we have um, kept it as Q2 for some very high touch clients that can't really navigate that period of time of four hours of waiting for their next dose um, and also aren't able to kind of um, pace their dosing out over that four hour period. So for some clients, we do dose up to 10 times a day, although it's not the most ideal. Um, and the list here is also a good rep representation of how different our dosing schedules can be for some clients. This is kind of representative of what our current state is with our current clients in MAP, but um, on this chart, one client is receiving 16 SDEs a day, and then down to one client is only receiving two SDEs a day. So it really is very individualized per client, um, what their alcohol needs are, making sure they're comfortable, but not over intoxicated. Um, and again, clients can ask between even once their dosing schedule is set, they can ask for a PRN and they know they can and they can come down as long as they're not intoxicated and receive an extra dose of alcohol. Um, 
We'll also engage with folks that they are asking for more about, you know, what's going on and try to reinforce other coping skills for them. At any time, someone can ask for a reduction in their doses, which we can do safely, um, or they can ask for an increase. And we, we again, it's very client centered um, and in conjunction with the nurse practitioner or the provider who is the one that's essentially writing the orders for, for the alcohol. In addition, we do MAP, um, MAT and um, other kind of harm reduction strategies we do with clients while they're with us in MAP. Next slide. So just to talk a little bit about the day to day and the services, in addition to just alcohol that we try to provide for clients. So, again, many of our clients, these are our street um, have been unhoused for decades, living on the street, not able to navigate the shelter system. And in reality, are, are we call them high, high utilizers of multiple systems. Many of them are bouncing in, in the ER several times a day. So here they are in map. Um, they're living amongst peers and it's a whole different environment for them. So we see it also as an opportunity to link them to other services. So many of our clients get linked to primary care, behavioral health, case management, housing resources. We have some folks working on immigra immigration status and income. Um, and then we also try to have access to uh, groups on site, activities, community building, and we currently have a health worker that we started with us about six months ago and has really ramped up our, our community events. The photo there is an ofrenda that um, we helped the clients put together for Dia de los Muertos. Um, the other photo is a really beautiful poem that one of our clients early on in COVID, there was some virtual poetry classes and we had no idea that this client had any kind of poetry skills and he wrote the most beautiful poetry we had ever, ever read. And he consistently participated in this group for over a year. Um, something that, you know, living on the street, bouncing between ER, it would not have been accessible for him. So we're um, in the process of putting together a book of all of his poetry that he um, produced while he was in MAP. So, in addition, we also do like outings to parks, um, shopping trips for the clients. A couple of months ago, we had some symphony tickets that were given to us. So, two of our clients were able to attend the symph symphony, just stuff that would really be unheard of for these clients um, kind of in their previous state, not being in managed alcohol. Um, two things that have been difficult, um, while there's so many things that work really well, two things that have been difficult is, um, as you know, many of the clients are using alcohol to kind of, for, for a variety of things going on in their life. And so we do see early on um, behavioral health and mental health um, stuff emerge. Um, and a lot of our clients are pretty disconnected from the mental health system. So uh, our future state, we're really looking, how can we connect to behavioral health services very early on, even as part of their, their intake process? Um, we have um, unfortunately lost to care several clients that really just couldn't tolerate um, this new way of drinking. Um, and we have cl some clients that have some pretty significant psychosis that emerges. So really trying to look at ways to also support those clients so we can retain them in care. Um, the second thing that's been difficult is clients, they report a lot of boredom. They, on the streets, their, um, their time is occupied in different ways. So now they're here, they're drinking in a more stable fashion. And so we're really trying to, um, have a more robust community program on site that we can, um, help clients kind of combat that boredom that they start to face once they're in the managed alcohol program. Things future state we're looking to have is harm reduction therapy groups on site and also bringing in some life skills and voc rehab and um, our goal is really not to just like support people with their drinking, but also use it as an opportunity to link to other services and work on other goals and skills while they're with us. Next client. Um. I'm going to jump back in to talk a little bit about participant descriptions and um, uh, some early outcomes. So, so to date, um, our program has, has served 37 unique participants um, with a total of 51 discrete episodes. Um, um, the majority of um, our participants have been male, 86%, and most of our participants are in the middle age, 45 to 55 age range with an average age of um, 54. 
percent of our participants are white, 35% Latinx or indigenous, though we anticipate that um, percentage will grow in with time uh, with our um, with our goal um, uh, census um, uh, serving that population and 16% are black African American. At, as Megan had mentioned, at the time of enrollment, the majority of our participants were um, unsheltered homeless, and a smaller number of participants came to us after struggling in the shelter system or in um, uh, housing, either permanent supportive housing or independent housing. Um, in the first, first 18 months of our program, 78% of MAP clients started or continued on MAT while they were enrolled with us. Um, and this underscores the multi-pronged approach we take to help stabilize participants within their own alcohol consumption goals. Um, on average, um, the average number of SDEs um, consumed by clients um, sorry, um, were 11.5 um, um, with a range of two to 20. Um, and most uh, participants either have stable um, stable alcohol consumption during their time with us um, or um, or decrease their use. Um, in terms of outcomes, um, for those individuals who've been um, who've had six months since their time of enrollment, um, we've seen a four um, fourfold decrease in ED utilization, um, a twofold decrease in EMS activation, and a twofold decrease in hospitalizations. And many um, the nature of hospital individuals' hospitalizations have also changed from hospitalizations associated with trauma um, in that were experienced in the context of overintoxication to more um, medical related hospitalizations. But more in many ways, more importantly, participants um, in the program have reported improved sense of health, hope and safety, um, which is um, one of um, the primary goals of the program in addition to utilization. To date, we don't have a formal qualitative component of our program evaluation process, but we do regularly check in with clients regarding their program participation goals and how the program is um, meeting their needs. So these quotes are paraphrases of some of the feedback our team has heard in the last few months. So, um, for example, one client um, was offered a permanent supportive housing um, unit, and he declined it at that time, saying, right now, I'm doing so well here. I have never felt more stable than I do now. I don't want to give that up. And a number of our clients have reflected, if I wasn't here at Site 42, that's our, um, our initial shelter-in-place hotel um, site number, um, I would already be dead. I'm sure of it. Um, a newly enrolled um, client struggling to remain in the program reflected that these three weeks in MAP are the best I've felt in a really long time. And then MAP returning after self-discharge um, uh, quoted, wild horses couldn't drag me away when we asked him if he was glad to be back. But in general, the participants have really reflected on um, their appreciation of the sense of community, their pride in being able to maintain a space um, after spending so many years uh, of unsheltered street home, um, homelessness, and then actually having a, a, a supportive community, uh, supportive um, staff uh, who they felt uh, cared for and saw them as as people and as uh, individuals. Um, before we um, close up and, and leave um, space for um, questions, I want to pivot um, to talk a bit about how we approach the ethical questions and challenges inherent in this work. So as our program evolved from a short-term isolation and quarantine shelter-in-place model during COVID to the longer-term continuity program that Megan is describing, a number of recurrent ethical questions began surfacing um, given the nature of this work, um, how sick our population is, um, and um, how high acuity um, the individuals are that we serve. So in general, these ethical questions have fallen into one of three main categories. The, the first one is the acute harms of um, MAP enrollment. For example, if someone is in MAP and they get admitted to the hospital for something like a GI bleed from a peptic ulcer disease, and they're telling us that they plan to continue to consume alcohol, whether or not they return to MAP, is it ethical to take them back to the program? The second category is 
the long-term harms of actively facilitating alcohol use when someone has a progressive illness or functional decline. For example, a client who's been with us um, for a long period of time, a year and a half, and we see them being starting to have functional um, complications that aren't being made that are that are um, worsened in the context of their choosing to continue to drink alcohol with us. And finally, since our team relies so heavily on the ethical um, tenant of patient autonomy, how do we enroll and support individuals with cognitive impairments um, or individuals who have the inability for whatever reason to acknowledge the impact that alcohol use is having on their medical and functional status? And these are the questions that our team has um, been thinking about and processing as we have developed and grown um, over the last two and a half years. So as we've processed these difficult questions, our team has relied heavily on a partnership with the San Francisco General Hospital ethics team. Through a series of structured ethics consults, our team has developed an ethical framework that we use to think through these really challenging questions. This ethical framework relies heavily on the core tenets of medical ethics, placing primacy on patient autonomy and trying to balance that autonomy on our team's commitment to do as little harm as possible. At the same time, understanding that our participants are ongoing alcohol use disorder in the context of the desire to continue to consume al alcohol can be life-threatening and potentially life-limiting. We've also tried to integrate principles of palliative care into our model, um, really with a highlight on the importance of placing patient preference over clinician preference. So almost always when we face as a team a challenging question about whether or not someone is appropriate for MAP or whether or not we're doing right by our clients, we consider a few basic questions. The first question is, does the participant think the ma that managed alcohol is the right option for them at this moment? Can the participant imagine or envision a life without drinking now or in the future? And does the team think that this participant is safer in MAP? or in an alternative situation. Because often if we decide that someone isn't appropriate for MAP, the alternative is uncontrolled, uh, unsupported drinking in the community. And often by talking through those questions together as a group, um, it has helped us forge a path forward. And all of the time, our conclusion has been that continuing in managed alcohol um, is the more ethical and appropriate thing to do, given um, the lack of other options and, and the client's um, goals at the time to continue drinking. Now, supporting um, our participants is not limited just to the services that we provide in the managed alcohol program. Our team works closely with a variety of community partners, including our local community paramedic program that Megan ma uh, mentioned earlier, um, as well as um, our street medicine team um, that provides continuity of primary care for many of our participants. Um, I would also like to highlight that our team has developed a really close relationship with the San Francisco General Addiction Consult team that refers um, patients both for new intakes when they um, engage with someone in the hospital who isn't expressing a desire for abstinence and they think they would be a good fit for us, they'll, they'll submit referrals. Um, and they also help facilitate um, goals of care discussion or um, uh, act as an in-between with inpatient teams when we um, have someone admitted to the hospital who has a um, who, who's enrolled in our program because that transition period can be challenging. 